Thank you ever so much, Matt. So uh, Matt G studied his MA at Wimbledon College of Art in 2012. He works in a variety of mediums, including painting, sculpture, collage, printmaking and photography. The work mainly looks at the anthropocene through a materially led practice using themes of consumption and hovering over the ambiguity between natural and artificial objects. Recent shows include uh, Gallery 286 and Husk in London and he is currently working on collaborating remotely with artists working on self-led community projects that he will now speak about within this talk. Thank you ever so much, take it away. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thanks Sam and Susie for having me and thanks to everyone that's come along uh, on a sunny day uh, to spend a bit of time with us today. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you a bit about, okay, that's, that's not changing is it? There we go. So I'm going to show you some images from a residency I did that had quite a transformative sort of impact on me. Um, it was in Iceland about four years ago. And it was a sense of this imposed isolation or sort of optional isolation as opposed to the sort of imposed isolation that we have now. It was um, in sort of like a really isolated area of Iceland uh, with about eight artists sort of dotted around this lava field. And this sort of isolation created quite a sort of different way of seeing the world um, as opposed to now. It was sort of more of a fertile creative world with um, sort of it took an entire day to get there uh, for a start which was quite interesting in terms of pushing oneself out of their usual comfort zone sort of always growing up in towns and cities and living in London so sort of this I this sort of feeling of being very isolated was something very beneficial for my practice um, so yeah so the lava fields were surrounding us and it was pretty much about 30, 40 miles to the nearest town and uh, the moss was really the only thing that had any sort of colour so it sort of felt like you were on a different planet and the, the moss was also like really fragile and quite symbolic in a sense because a lot of it takes four to ten years to grow and it's a, a really sort of arid, dry, bare landscape because of the climate that's in Iceland. So there's a sort of slogan that goes around and it's sort of ingrained in Iceland is, is don't step on the moss. And it's pretty much uh, battered into you by locals as soon as you arrive, which is a really positive thing, I think. This respect for nature and sort of nourishing it. Um, and I took this just to sort of illustrate the light um, and how this was basically two o'clock in the morning and because it was in the summer it was not really getting particularly dark and this sort of light and this sort of atmospheric feeling and the sort of difference in air, the air was very fresh, um, all these things sort of fed as a vacuum into my work later and I guess I'm sort of showing you because I think these sort of experiences do play a big part in an artist's practice in terms of the sort of vacuum of influence that occurs over time. So I sort of started creating these photos um, using a Holger camera, just a sort of cheap toy camera uh, usually associated with like Russian brands and working just with uh, using film to alter the light to create a sort of dystopian sort of quite threatening landscape um, and then once I developed them I could also like sand into them using sandpaper to create sort of lava effects um, just to sort of add a sort of menacing aspect to the landscape and so yeah, I mentioned as it sort of took me out of my comfort zone. Um, there was this cave where about five of us visited, and it's, it's just like nothing I've ever experienced really. Um, it was within walking distance uh, from where all the cabins were, and it was about fifteen hundred meters long. And as you can see on the left-hand side image, it was extremely steep, 
covered in snow, very icy. Um, but I don't know, there's something about this vulnerability that it creates, that you're at the mercy of nature that, was, that sort of makes you feel alive. It's, it sort of sounds like a cliche, but it really does uh, feed into your work. Um, so there's something magical about it. And at the end, there was these, these ice formations that you can see on the right. And one of the guys that was with me was Icelandic, and he'd lived in Iceland all his life. And he said, that's the elf city. Um, and I'd, also, I'd always been aware of this belief that Icelandic people have in elves. And we sort of think about that as elves. And we've sort of got preconception of what elves are related to Christmas. Um, you know, like Will Ferrell, and um, but, but to them, it's it's sort of more of a, a conceptual thing that they that they have educated and drilled into them from a young age. So, if when they're growing up, they're they're told to respect nature, respect the landscape, not to go towards things like these ice formations because you'll disrupt the elves. And it's sort of a way of enticing children in, and engaging children from a very young age into having this respect for nature. And I found that really poetic and really powerful and really inspirational actually sort of something that i think you could sort of carry forward into really educating people from a young age into having respect for landscape and having respect for nature um but yeah it's, it's sort of one of those things that um, maybe is misinterpreted um over here but yeah that was basically was quite eye-opening for me in terms of thinking about nature um so I brought this mirror along with me, uh, it was 40 centimetres and sort of 40 centimetre diameter, sort of wanted to make a tangible object appear digital. So it's like this mirrored acrylic disc. And I don't know, I was just sort of walking around with it and I found this slot in this big chunk of lava and I slotted it in and it matched, as I stepped back, the, the, the hill behind me matched up with the, the hill in front of me. And it sort of created this perfect alignment. And there was something quite surreal about that. It was also quite surreal because I hadn't seen someone for like two days. It was that isolated. And I don't know, it was just quite unusual. And then I tried to do it again with a better camera and I didn't manage to do that because it was too windy. And I kept trying again for the next few days, but it still didn't work. So it was just kind of a interesting experience. Um, so, I brought along some copper sulfate uh, solution. So this is like um, something you can grow crystals with. Um, so the rock in the middle is this rock I added to the rock collection they had at the residency centre, um, where I grew some copper sulfate on a rock. I'll talk a bit more later about the sort of chemistry that I get involved with. Um, yeah, so I made these. I don't know if anyone's got any 3D glasses with them. Um, so the roads around Iceland, I sort of felt like they were lucky charms. They're sort of like like into that cereal that you can get because it was just full and rich of things like obsidian, lava, different kinds of rocks. And I had I had this bike that they lent to me at the residency centre and I'd cycle it around. And every now and again, I'd sort of get had to stop because I just see so many different rocks that were so interesting and inspiring. Um, but there's a sort of element of, yeah, wanting to leave them in the landscape as well. Although it is legal to take rocks as long as they're not part of the list that they have there. So as long as they're like, but, but there's a real abundance as long as you don't take too many. But um, yeah, sort of this is good for someone obsessed with geology. Um, <coughs> So I started using obsidian in some of my work and sort of uh, symbolically linking it into well, material, in terms of the materiality, linking it to acrylic perspex and thinking about how it almost looks like an iPhone screen as well. We've got this really glossy artificial looking surface. Um, and then Thinking about the Anthropocene, so the Anthropocene is, for those of you that haven't heard of it, it's, it's basically a geological age, the current geological age, where it's viewed as the period during which human activity has been the dominant influence in terms of climate and the environment that we live in. So I started hearing about this substance called plasticlomerate. Um, and plasticlomerate is where plastic 
melts in the lava stream in areas where plastic is heavily left and areas where there's lots of plastic pollution and then it melts into lava and then it melts into lava the lava cools off and then you get this rock that has bits of rope in bits of plastic that's fossilized which is obviously really tragic but it's kind of interesting as well that this has happened on such a long-term basis that geologists um, who are obviously prevalent within this Anthropocene epoch have actually defined this as a new thing and so at the time I started thinking about making my own uh, geodes because I'm really interested in geodes um, the, the, the rocks uh, with crystals on the inside um, these were made out of polyurethane and so it was a process where I started using polyurethane to create domes and then hollowing out the inside and then filling it with potassium sulfate or copper sulfate or magnesium aluminium sulfate so I'd sort of create the sculptures and then fill them with the crystal solution and then leave them to crystallize over like a period of one to three months in the studio um, so here's a close-up of two of them so they all came in pairs much like if you cracked a, a, a lava rock open and found crystals on the inside um, so the element of authenticity and sort of this idea of an object that we're not quite sure where it's come from is something that's always in my work um, so the paint I used was this stone effect paint and I found that the names of the paint interesting it was basically Gotham Grey and Canyon Red as in the Grand Canyon so that was quite interesting the way that even the brands of paint have these 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 sort of names that derive from certain areas and we're led to believe that we're creating some kind of imitation of some substance that's from afar and so I used <clears throat> use those to question that so you can't really see the crystals too much they're really small it's sort of so sort of see them twinkling a little bit there um, and then this was using aluminium potassium sulfate and the Gotham grey so it's this idea of marrying up two objects from different areas um, and then I started experimenting by using the aluminium potassium sulfate and mixing different food dyes to create different colours <clears throat> and obviously like framing them as if they're in a cabinet of curiosity so And so this was a, a sheet of agate that I was imitating that I'm using copper sulfate crystal uh, paint and card. So I wanted to imitate it using the sort of cheapest materials possible to create this imitation. And then there's other times where I've found processes whereby I can control the crystal growth by so which which sort of interested me at the time because this idea of a substance that grows naturally and sort of almost like grows as if it's living because it's it's thawing and it's moving in different directions but then controlling it and tapering it by using certain mediums on surfaces and so this is um, the 10 Rorschach tests that psychologists use um, so I was kind of interested in how them in themselves are a very sort of random application but also yeah, random application in the sense that they're ink and sort of left on a page but they're, they're a very distinct design and a very formulaic design um, and I started to explore using paint on top of the crystals so to, to create this sort of um, pyrite effect um, I'd always been interested in pyrite ever since I went to Legoland. So there was this, I don't know if everyone's been to Legoland, but these, this, this uh, treasure hunt ride that they had there, you could get the bits of pyrite um, out of the sand and it was called Fool's Gold. It was always called Fool's Gold, but I was sort of interested in creating like a Fool's Fool's Gold as well. Um, and then I got really into ceramics. 
to the point where I couldn't stop making loads of plates, mugs, and but then eventually sort of started tying it back into my work and started making geodes and I was interested in the relationship with using a material that's earth which is the clay and then firing it in the same way that a geode would be formed from molten lava and eventually the bubbles would cool off within the geode and form a natural uh, form within and here's an example of a larger one uh, using triangular ceramic pieces instead and this one I wanted to create something that almost looked burnt out so I used this matte black glaze which had sort of a little bit of a shiny surface to it but at the same time sort of had this burnt out feeling as if it had been overused, destroyed um, and then has a little area where there's a bit of polyurethane filling in the gap as if it a bit had been chipped off and then you've got um, yeah, a bit, a bit. It's called filling, basically. That one. <clears throat> so I really got into using cyanotypes at about this point, and I was thinking about the plastic conglomerate. Um, I was thinking about things that are in my studio, so artifacts that I've made in my studio, and I was thinking about other things from the Anthropocene, such as thing that's in the middle called Detroit Agat, which is basically where paint has collected at the car factory in Detroit and it's building up and it's building up and all the layers have built up from the way the cars have sprayed and they eventually form this object that looks just like Crystal Agat and that's the one in the middle. The piece on the right was taken from a sculpture that I made and then the one on the left is a photo of a painting with crystals that I made, but then I've started using the cyanotype liquid uh, in different ways. So what I'd do is basically just take areas of the paper to create a photosensitive area. So I wanted to think about taxonomy, classification, sort of arranging things into cyanotypes based from objects and and then this was the outcome, so I decided to create a grid of 24 works um, and I made them with a, a large border to sort of emphasise the scientific sort of classification methods that are used. Uh, so again you've got a combination of things I found in the studio, uh, plastic conglomerate imagery and sort of more textural painterly applications so there's another angle so there's there's all kinds of pieces there and the sort of idea was that I wanted to use the cyan from the cyanotype to unify all of those components so if you, if you just go closer so the piece on the right there is a exposure taken from a sheet of a guard so I actually used some objects in some of them so you by using the objects I can mask off certain areas and then the photo sensitive areas will become cyan. Some of them are taken from negatives of photos and some of them are taken from negatives of photos of objects in my studio. <clears throat> so I wanted to create something that sort of towered over people, sort of felt quite confrontational physically. Um, so I made this piece out of polyurethane and chrome uh, paint. Uh, it's 2.5 meters and so it appears heavy um, as if it's made from lead or slate or graphite or geological formations. Uh, so I wanted to sort of subvert the physicality of an object and yeah. And then moving on from that, I was looking into making works uh, based on stratas. Um, I was, it was sort of around about a time when 
fracking was coming to the UK and I was thinking about cross sections and stratas, making something that resembled a strata, something that resembled a very arid landscape uh, with remnants of drilling and um, miniatures basically. So they're, they're probably about, I think this was about 30 centimetres by 20 centimetres and then 10 centimetres from the wall. And I made a few of those. So this would be resembling sort of latter stage of the process. So I started coming across uh, palimpsests. So this is an example of a Greek manuscript of the Bible from the fifth century, uh, which is a, a, an example of a palimpsest. And it was from a, it was mentioned to me from a recent work from a tutor that I work with. And it's basically a manuscript of a piece of writing material on which writing has been superimposed or effaced earlier writing. So, or it could be something that's reused or altered, but still bearing visible traces of its earlier form. So this sort of really appealed to me and there's sort of been something that I think about within my work, this idea of taking away, adding, removing, reapplying, overlaying. Uh, and I sort of see that within some forms of street art, some forts of, um, so this is Niall's shoe, uh, sort of in fly posting, general wear and tear, um, public sculptures that are polished from people sit sitting on them. Um, I'll always remember like, even like in rural areas, so you've got Henry Moore's sculptures that are polished from all the sheep that are walking past them. Then I just stuck some photos I've sort of taken over the last few months that sort of act as a vacuum of stimulus into my current thinking um, of, of sort of this urban palimpsest. So this this is just a, someone had dropped an ice cream and then I, I just love this quick public intervention of spontaneity with some tape. And I'm sure we're all familiar with like the laughing gas or um, nitrous oxide. Uh, canisters that are laying around everywhere and I just I don't know I find it quite interesting how this one almost seemed embedded within the floor it I don't know it just sort of seemed like a bit of a relic or like it fossilized <clears throat> so this idea of something covering up um, and wrapping and growing within really sort of interests me this sort of signs of wear and tear and history and sort of linking those towards erosion and natural occurring formations and <clears throat> so uh, this is an artist I worked with recently called Nathan Bowen and I sort of appreciated his mark making and how he works and then you see see people working over the top of it and I'm sort of interested in street art in terms of working with street artists but also how even though everything sort of shut down, they seem to continue working and sort of making pieces like this to sort of try and build morale, try and you can use it as a, a sort of way of communicating with people. And it's instantaneous, like um, it, it's, it's, it's there within a few hours. I sort of really appreciate that. And I started working here with him on some pieces and that's something we'll probably continue and this is another artist called Stewie who I've started working with and we're going to be sort of thinking about certain icons within the world and working on creating this sort of urban palimpsest by building up uh, boards of paintings by sending them back and forth so it's a remote like a remote collaboration whereby we'll sort of send a piece of board back and forth and work over the top of it and just sort of see where it goes but I sort of enjoy the sort of cave painting resemblance that street art has in some cases. Um, it sort of seems like a very traditional and ancient form of applying paint on, on a wall. Um, yeah. So this was actually probably one of the most uh, biggest turning points that I saw in Iceland. So it was, uh, wasn't the geysers, it wasn't necessarily all the waterfalls, it was this. So. This is basically the last McDonald's that was in Iceland. Um, it was sold in 2009. So 
six years later, I stumbled across it. So I was about there in 2015, just happened to be staying at this hostel that was kind of acting like a halfway house because where I was staying was too far away from the airport. So I had to stay at a hostel on the way. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to make it within a day before my flight. And what's interesting is it appears to not have decomposed at all. So this, at the time of this photo, it was six years old. Um, so basically, after the financial crash in Iceland, uh, they raised the tariffs. And apparently, like for a kilo of onion to, to import, it would be the same as a uh, bottle of whiskey, is what the, the guy from Iceland said. And he said, they said, rather than a bailout for businesses, um, Iceland just decided to sort of support its local businesses um, after the financial crash. So basically in 2009, someone decided to buy it, the last burger, and uh, but he moved to Denmark. So he decided to give it to the National Museum. Um, the National Museum could not store it after two years due to regulations. So it was given to the hostel. So that's how I ended up stumbling across it. And yeah, it just it's just interesting how it was. It seems to be treated like this relic, and yeah, years have gone by and um, it's still there. And you can even check it out on the live stream. And so I was interested as well in how this build up of posters and detritus has this sort of similarity to geology. And it sort of reminds me of the dendrochronology of like tree rings and fossils and sort of gives us an indicator as to the history and how we can look back and how we can like cut through a cross section of something and see the history of what's happened in the same way as if you cut into a rock. So with that in mind, I started collecting bus posters. So they're about eight foot tall and recreating this sort of imitation of a of a billboard dendrochronology. So this one in particular, I was looking at sort of creating this fictional dendrochronology of Iceland revealing its last McDonald's. So if you if you were to come across this white square and sort of gently peel away at all the posters that have been building up over those six years, you'd eventually find the, the poster that was advertising the last the last burger. And this sort of piece about consumption, about mass consumption, about imagery, about how we're sort of bombarded with bright colours that in some way are beautiful to sort of like brighten up a city, but it's also pretty obscene. Um, and a sort of skin-like healing like onion effect that you get with rocks and geodes and uh, the trace behind is an indicator. <clears throat> yeah, at the same time, it sort of appears fresh, like a bright new poster. Um, and that's because the posters I got were obviously preserved in a, a frame is it, uh, at the bus station. So I sort of wanted these fresh posters unmarked to look as if, yeah, they had been preserved. And then I started creating miniature works as well, using the posters. Um, I wanted to create a more intimate domestic version, sort of Ikea version that could act as a multiple um, and become a commodity within itself. Um, um, started thinking about how the final image within these compositions could be prominent um, and trying to figure out ways of taking imagery out of their contexts. Uh, so this image, I wanted it to look as if it was an image of journalism, something from a newspaper, but it's actually an image just from a video game advert. And I was thinking about how much imagery in video games is, is based on violence and how there's a lot of conflict within video games and just sort of questioning what that's about. Um, And then I began to sort of work with these collages using film posters and teasing out landscapes, uh, geological structures, uh, using symbols from film posters to form the landscapes. Uh, so using 
the faded out fonts from the film credits to sort of act as crevices and sort of abstract mountainous landscapes. Um, this mossy green again started to filter through on a lot of the posters. So the mossy green that had come from sort of in, within my visions of Iceland. And yeah, sort of a lot of these things started to reappear back back in London and from the posters that I was collecting. And a sort of element of nostalgia came about. <clears throat> And then again, these two, I was, I was thinking about the McDonald's posters, the wrap of the day, thinking about geological structures and forms. Um, and then I started incorporating some printmaking, making etchings. And I was making etchings, uh, rep, um, sorry making etchings based on the graffiti that I would see on my daily walks. So I'd go on a walk, make a note of the graffiti and then trace it into an etching and then build it up and take more and more and again, create this idea of a, a dendrochronology um, by adding elements of found graffiti and doodling um, on different etching plates. And I wanted to create this relic looking piece that sort of displayed a history of a period of time, treating and sort of again, but thinking about the sort of sacredness of materials and imagery and how sort of treating a sort of sacred 320 GSM Somerset paper as if it's like a fly posting material, as if it's like um, a, throwaway, a throwaway material, like something that you just use for fly posting. To again, again, to sort of conceptually question, uh, yeah, the sacredness of an image and how maybe we sort of need to think about how we preserve certain things and and nature preservation and things like that. And again, incorporating some abstract imagery taken from our walks and then thinking about how we're bombarded with imagery and then how we can become it can become relatively fragmented within our mind's eye the sort of idea that we're taking in so much uh, stimulus or maybe not so much nowadays but um thinking about making traditionally made prints this sort of ancient method of using an etching press and then just tearing them up and not being sort of quite so precious um and then moving on to using a shredder and sort of distorting the imagery even more um, using two different colors to sort of emphasize this this uh, this effect of a sort of glitch effect and I wanted to line them up in rows to sort of create this slatted billboard effect again thinking back to billboards and the idea of when you're walking past one of these slatted billboards you sort of catch a glimpse of a slatted image uh, not quite process what the imagery is <clears throat> and then I sort of started going back to the printmaking and creating prints of photo etchings based on the imitations of the fly posting compositions that I've made and then the nice thing about photo etching is you can then scratch into the plate and then reprint and then scratch into the plate again and sort of add different organic sort of mark making um, using a variety of tools so again that fed into the idea of the palimpsest again this sort of idea of creating something that looks like it's got a history to it and then creating this fictitious history and relic nature to it and then this again was another piece based on that ideology and this was based on a painting that I've made using gold leaf, uh, billboard posters, ink and strips of billboard. And then since lockdown, I've started get, making digital paintings such as this. Uh, I think it's more to do with a lack of space to make stuff in and just getting really obsessive 
um, having lots of time to work on stuff. I mean, I'm still working from home and my teaching role, but as I'm sure everyone's sort of realizing there's a lot more spare time. So been making a lot of digital drawings and this one was based on a sort of idea that during the first few weeks of lockdown, this sort of underground would form more sort of decay and, and sort of urban palimpsests because all this sort of essential work had ceased. So you would have less uh, non-essential work, sorry. So people replacing the advertisements would sort of not be doing that anymore. Um, and yeah, just enjoying working with collage again and thinking about how we're bombarded with less and less imagery and how perhaps when we come out, a lot of imagery will be jostling for position. So I was thinking about creating this collage where there's lots of imagery jostling for place, like sort of all the same format, but we can't quite figure out what the imagery is. And as Sam mentioned at the start, I'm thinking more about making community sort of based work. So at the moment I'm teaching remotely and um, so um, I sort of started this project with some of my students to create posters, um, basically encouraging people to stay at home during VE day. Cause I thought as VE day was approaching, it looked really sunny and the weather weather was good and I don't know there was a sort of sense that a lot of people would go out and um, maybe celebrate out but it, it was sort of an idea that I wanted the students to sort of think about making something that would yeah encourage people to stay at home and sort of, um, something that would sort of advise and encourage people to be responsible and sort of just and also boost morale so something just that would tell people that you know they're doing a great job and that way it gave the students like something to look forward to and some sort of sense of purpose so they it, the system was I basically had it emailed to me and then print them off and then I found this uh, disused billboard which is usually used for a pub and yeah it sort of acted as something nice for people on their walks on their one a day walks to to look at and yeah, I sort of put the posters in twos to sort of replicate a a fly posting uh, fly posting effect, and that's it really. Um, I'm just yeah, cool. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much, Alan Thanks. and Anne. It's so good to see you guys. It's so so weird, like talking on your own. <laughs> it is well, huh? Yeah, it's hey, like. Hey, Kate. All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> got any questions? Um, um, I've got a question actually. Um, so the plastic conglomerate. Did you actually find some on your very remote residency? I mean, like, had the plastic made it that far away from people, or? Uh, no, or, it's, I, it, I mean, or, or was that kind of closer to a town? No, the usual places where it is is this a place in Hawaii that has quite a lot of it, and that's from a lot of plastic that's burnt on the beaches and goes into the lava stream, into the volcano. So I've never actually come across it myself. Uh, it's more stuff like obsidian and other rocks like that that I've come across, but I've never come actually come across it. I've just seen imagery of it. Um, you can actually order it online, but it's really expensive. I don't know why. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I bet people are going to start making it if they start ordering it online, and then. Yeah. It seems like kind of irresponsible, but I, I can imagine that happening. Mm. Sort of exploiting it, yeah. <laughs> the human, the human condition. I was going to ask you. Um, you have a really process-led practice, which. Mm. Yeah, it may not be so obvious uh, when within the objects you know, in, with, with, in, within space. Um, I was wondering if you document it heavily because you know I think that it would be really interesting to see this process-led um, practice that you lead. 
And also, I mean, is is alchemy something that has ever really truly interested you? Because I know that there can be a bit of a it can be people are put off by the term alchemy. Yeah. You know, it has lots of different sort of connotations attached to it. Do you mean like document the different stages of a process, like make like actually making the work or filming the work? Oh, okay. Um, I have in the past, but it's been more about when I've made work that's can, got a kinetic element to it. So hmm. if it's involving like turntables moving, um, I've made work using smoke machines as well. Right. Um, so there was an element of displaying stuff on turntables because it, it framed it in a certain context. But I haven't, do you mean like any of the works in particular that I've shown or? I think I think all of the practice that you showed I mm. mean there's a hell of a lot of layering you know yeah um, and it's it's interesting to see where you know one stops you know where, mm. where's a decision that you've decided okay that is that is it and I thought maybe you know uh, I know artists which they they keep they sort of like montages of, of works and up to the point at which they've decided okay that's it for them mm. Uh, and then the work out there. Yeah. Mm, exactly. Yeah, that, that'd be really interesting, actually. Yeah, like a sort of time lapse. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Do you think? Are you going to keep going back to Iceland? Do you like a Bonnie Holland style? Uh, I'd love to. Yeah. Not at the moment, but um, hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, that yeah, I've been twice now. So that was a residency that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. But there's a lot of residencies there. So I'd recommend anyone interested in eventually going on residencies to look at, like there's one called resartist.com. So resartist without the T, I can post it in the chat. And so yeah, there is a lot of residencies in Iceland. They're really big on that. Here, I'll just post this in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to go back. There's something very special about it, but I'd like to also go to other places that are sort of similar. And uh, maybe Finland as well. I don't know if anyone's been there. I'd like to go to check out that. Yeah, yeah I've been to Finland. I, I've been to Iceland too, and I really want to go back at a different time of year. I went in um, kind of uh, like, well, summer, which is not really summer in Iceland. <laughs> it was still really cold. Um, but yeah, I'd really like to go back in winter and see how it's different. Yeah. It yeah, because you you were there. Have you been in the same season both times? Um, I think the earliest I went was April, and that was yeah, that was pretty cold then. But the, that time was like April May. Yeah, it was like snowing a lot of the time because it was quite central. So because obviously it's warmer near the uh, near the coast. Um, so yeah, it was quite unpredictable. Like one one time it'd be quite clear and. Then, about 10 minutes later it would be pelted with hail but I quite enjoyed that it was it was just quite exciting being out of your comfort zone like that and being cycling around just in the middle of nowhere it's great yeah, yeah cool. got any other questions yeah well when, when does a decorative object you know, become a like a focal point for a contemporary culture Um, <laughs> That's a heavy question, Sam. <laughs> yeah, decorative object. Become a contemporary, what was it again, sorry? <laughs> become become a contemporary focal point. Right. What do you mean? In sorry, I, 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 I really, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I really don't, I, I didn't mean to throw you. Yeah, it has uh, thrown me a bit, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just I just think it's interesting because um, you know um, a, a lot of the objects I I didn't realise actually that a lot of the objects you've made completely you know from from your studio you know I mean they're that sort of close to to the reality of what they are I mean it's really really interesting um, I just I suppose that you know okay there's the decorative and then there's also this like the throwaway and then there's the sense of decay. Mm. Do you know what I mean? All yeah. these things which are ringing very true in sort of parallels. It's just, I mean, it's a really interesting practice actually, um, and you're really insightful. Um, uh, I think when there's a sort of less preciousness, so you mean, so maybe 
Yeah, the sort of idea of taking prints out of their frames and sort of working into them and mixing them with other mediums, I think that. But then, I'm just, yeah, I still make prints and sort of frame them and sell them framed and make them into editions, but I, I don't know, I just find it kind of exciting working and tearing bits of prints up and, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, it's interesting with your uh, billboard project with your students that you've kind of tied in a lot of your own practice into yeah. a project that you do with your students. Do you do that quite often or is it more of um, a lockdown? Yeah, I think it was mainly inspired by lockdown. I have done a couple of shows um, recently with them, but that, to be honest, is more a sort of side curatorial sort of thing that I do. So I've done a, a work a show with my fine art students and then a, a show with my digital illustration students, um, one of which is actually still on. So it started in March and it's been locked in like some kind of <laughs> art tomb. Uh, so, that's, that's, so that's still there. Um, it's been a pretty long show, actually. They're getting, they're getting their value for money. Um, <laughs> but they, I don't know, they're, they're, yeah. So those two, but this, yeah, I guess it's something going forward because I think, yeah, there's, there's a sort of idea that, I don't know, I think it's really important to sort of think besides galleries for a while because I think they're sort of going to be struggling for a bit. And I think I want to encourage my students to sort of work together and pull together because it feels like at the moment they might be told to do the opposite, obviously for very responsible health reasons, you know, we're going through this stage of social distancing and and we're sort of encouraging each other to sort of stay two meters away, but to actually find some way of also coming together emotionally, I think it's really important. Yeah. yeah. I've never really thought about galleries as being kind of time capsules at the minute. <laughs> I've been thinking yeah. about the artworks having conversations when we're not there. Like, like, like the toys in the museum, and <laughs> kind of, they're all having a really great party. <laughs> I think I've been on my own too long. <laughs> Definitely a sign of madness. But yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'm definitely very interested in the kind of ecological side of your work. It's, it's, I think, brilliant. To be fair. Um, and your mention of the Detroit Agate was quite, uh, was really cool because they actually used that in jewellery. Okay. So I really like this idea that we're making these fossils and people are valuing this awful stuff over what's actually important over nature. So what it was really good jewelry? to hear about. What sort of jewellery do you make with it? I don't make it, good lord oh. no. But yeah, but people do polish it up and they set it into yeah, yeah. sterling silver jewellery and then, you know, it's like, why? <laughs> I'm interested in, these, in that idea of, of what people are actually valuing while the world is just falling apart and it's, mm. it's just bonkers and I think you highlight that in a really good way. So. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, it's kind um, of... I've got yeah. another question actually. Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, go on. No, it's cool. There you go ahead. Um, I was just thinking about, um, uh, I can't remember what you called them, the, the sculptures that you made where you grew the crystals inside. Um, and I'm assuming you made those when you were back in London or wherever you live um, yeah. after Iceland. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, because um, I was thinking about them being these kind of uh, faux objects, um, like these kind of fakes or um, imposters or something. but. Um, and also you've obviously got quite an interest in uh, like urban and you're talking about graffiti and urbanism and um, the, the kind of city landscape. But I was just thinking if if you weren't located in a city, do you think that would kind of switch the work in an opposite direction? Do you think you'd be um, kind of making work about uh, a city using natural things or do you see what I mean? Is, does your your locality play a part in this work. Um, does that uh, make sense? Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. I think from living in a city, sort of build this fascination for the sort of tropical or the sort of 
beautiful sort of object and that's sort of alien to me so it's not something I'd stumble across just by living in London and it sort of builds up that curiosity and that sort of fascination with replicating that and sort of creating something rather than purchasing it online and having it imported I wouldn't want to do that I'd want to recreate my own version in a way but it's, yeah so it's also the commentary on imitation and mimesis and sort of thinking about creating something that's a rock made out of plastic in the same way that plastic glomerate is a rock that's like 50 percent plastic so the geodes were really a, a commentary on that like creating something and defining that as an actual thing similar to the way detroit agart and uh, plastic glomerate have become things and then yeah does that sort of make sense uh yeah i think so yeah, yeah. um yeah i just I, I was i like that kind of relationship between the city and the uh and the sort of natural world and sort of thinking about them in tandem that being in one place mm. yeah. yeah i think it's definitely had a big impact living in a city as well just sort of seeing similarities and i think i'm sort of interested well, I sort of either like living in a really built up area or a really isolated area. So living in completely the middle of nowhere or living right in the hustle and bustle, things happening, sort of not like the in-between. So sort of, I guess that has sort of helped me draw parallels on like geological formations and things that I see in nature with things that I see in heavily built up areas. Um, like in particular, I've spent a lot of time in Berlin and just sort of like seeing the way the graffiti and the stickers and everything seems to just get absolutely peppered, particularly in sort of Friedrichstein and sort of areas like Neukölln. There's, there's just, I just find that really fascinating, that sort of trace of like wear and tear and how it sort of gets built up. And yeah, it's, it's a really nice thing. Okay, any last questions? All right, we do this every time. If we can uh, just unmute ourselves and give Matt a really big round of applause, please. <laughs>